You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. You're quite sure this is a genuine Tiffany? Quite. The provenance dates back to 1922. Very well, then. Kindly have it delivered. Of course, madam. Will that be cash or charge? Put it on my account. Very good. I can deliver it to your home by, let me see, Thursday at the latest. But I simply must have it tonight. I've invited the girls over for bridge. The girls. I see. Oh, Robert. Yeah? Yeah? See that Mrs. Gunt receives her lamp this afternoon. You mean today? Carried by hand to her front door. The servant's entrance, if you please. By all means. Ubermeyers is proud to be of service. If there's anything else we can provide, don't hesitate to... That will be all. Very good, ma'am. Want me to go over there right away? Not yet, Andrew. First, finish unpacking the new shipment quickly before the next Mark uh, <coughs> customer walks in. Yes, sir. Now then, what do we have? Three perfume bottles. Three cut glass vials to contain the the otter of damask rose petals. That's more like it. Next, pottery jugs too. Pottery jugs, indeed. Where's your aesthetic sense? You can't entice anyone by calling them pottery jugs. Really think people buy something because of what you call it? People don't come to buy anything in a gift emporium. They come because they don't know what they want. Then I sell them something. So what are you going to call these pottery jugs? Something exquisite. We'll display them on satin pillows with bread. A loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and thou beside me, singing in the wilderness. I'll unload them on some poor sucker before the morning's over. Okay, what about this? Hmm... When we buy a shipment from Morocco, sight unseen, I suppose we take what we can get. But to sell that will require some creativity. Now, clean this up at once. May I help you? I hope so. (laughs) I mean, I'm not sure. What's this? That would be an authentic voodoo mask. Oh. What about the pajamas? These are not pajamas, sir. They are a genuine imported harem girl's costume in 100% hand-sewn silk. Well, I don't know. It has to be something special. Very special. Suppose you describe the occasion and leave it to me. A personal gift? Not too personal. See, there's this girl in my office. Ah, a young lady. She's like a goddess. I wouldn't want her to think that I was implying... I mean... Of course not, sir. I understand. But for a beautiful young lady, uh, what is her occupation, may I ask? She's a secretary. Oh. I have it. Something for her desk. She's already got a computer and a lot of pencils. (laughs) Um... Something to remind her of you throughout the day. Subliminally, shall we say. Now, as to price... Would a hundred dollars be too extravagant? A hundred? But of course she mustn't feel bought. Romanced is more like it. Aha! Perfect. What is? It's ideal. Romantic, but subtle. Not forward. No, no. You mean this old... This magnificent antique. Truly distinguished. Fit for a goddess. I can't make up my mind. A perpetual reminder of your taste, your flair for romance. Fill this with fresh flowers and she won't be able to pluck you from her thoughts. Between nine and five, at least. After that, it's up to you. Uh, it's kind of tarnished, isn't it? That's not tarnish, sir. It's a patina. A testament to its authenticity. And only a mere... $20. Well, that is more reasonable, I guess. Put this in a gift box, will you, Robert? For a most discriminating gentleman. Sure thing. Thank you, sir, for making such a wise choice. I hope you'll allow us to serve you again when it's time for the engagement. Uh, don't mention it. 
cash, I presume. Meet Mr. George P. Hanley, a man life is always treated without deference, honor, or success. Waiters serve his soup cold. Elevator operators close doors in his face. And mothers never bother to wait up for the daughters he dates. For George is a creature of humble habits and tame dreams, a square peg in a square rut, and the living embodiment of what's commonly referred to as some poor sucker. He is, in short, an ordinary man. But at this moment, the accidental possessor of a very special gift, one that measures men not against their accomplishments, but against their deepest desires. The kind of gift most of us might ask for, then learn to regret. If, like Mr. George P. Hanley, we were about to plunge headfirst into our own personal Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, I Dream of Jeannie, starring Hal Sparks, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Everybody's still at lunch. I'll just leave this on Anne's desk. No card. She'll just figure out who it's from, right? By her keyboard. No, a little to the side. Oh, maybe on her chair. No. Oops. Better put this away for now. Where? Hmm. In my drawer. Hey, hey, Georgie Porgy, what happened to you? I, I had some errands. Well, you missed the worst chili con carne ever offered for human consumption. It set a new low, even for the greasy spoon Nick calls a diner. Fill my stomach, like a bag of rocks. I don't care much for chili. Georgie, witness a solemn vow for me, will you? I have to enter these municipal bonds. I, Roger Hackett, do solemnly swear never again to commit gastronomic Harry Carey at Nick's, starting on the day I get my promotion at this office. Your promotion? Yep. I thought everyone with equal seniority had the same chance. Mr. Watson said... That's correct, Georgie old Porgy. We're all equal. But some of us are a little bit more equal than others. Especially me. Hi, Ann. How are you? You're looking nice. Hello, boys. Don't be so sure, Roger. Mr. Watson's a fair man. I'm sure he'll compare our experience in debit financing, evaluating liabilities. And that old Georgie is one reason why I am more equal. All you think of is debits and liabilities with assets like hers around. Now, where'd I put my little surprise? Here, Anne, for you. What's this? Oh, just a little something to say happy birthday to the prettiest girl in the entire office. I'm the only girl. And you'd still be the prettiest, even if this whole place was staffed with Miss Americas. Are you going to open it? Roger, what? Go ahead. Oh, Roger, it's beautiful. Like it? Why, this is the most gorgeous penoir I've ever seen. Huh, is that what they call it? But it is awfully revealing. Then you'll just have to be careful who you wear it for. Hey, Ann, put it on. Can you feature old man Watson's puss when he calls you in for dictation? (laughs) Mr. Watson is interested in a different kind of figure, Sam. Is that what you think? You really like it? I love it. But you shouldn't have. You only have a birthday once a year, at least until you're 30. Then you have it once every two years. Oh, you bad boy. Come here. What? (laughs) That's to show my appreciation and to prove I haven't even learned to count to 30 yet. (laughs) And what, may I ask, is going on here? Oh, Mr. Watson... You see, it's my birthday, sir, and... Do any of you happen to be aware of the annual statement just issued by this organization? No one? Well, then it may come as a surprise for you to learn that we have just completed the best year in our history. And I believe this department had no small part in that success. (laughs) So, as a token of my appreciation, I think this is an appropriate time to invite all of you to be my guests at a private party, beginning just as fast as you can get yourselves over to the Tiki Club. (laughs) And as for you, young lady, I just want to say, they aren't the only ones who appreciate you. (laughs) 
Would you mind looking in my office? Uh, there should be a rather large crystal vase on my desk, full of long-stemmed red roses. There for you. Oh, they're lovely, Mr. Watson. You're a doll. See you all at the Tiki Club. Let's go, kid. Before he realizes he's off his nut and has himself committed. He's a sweet, dear old man. Anne, I, I just wanted to, um... Yes, George? Come on, Anne. I just wanted to say happy birthday. Why, thank you, George. Aren't you going with us? I'll... I'll be along. See you there. Come on, Roger. <sighs> I guess some people are more equal. Might as well throw this in the wastebasket. Can't give it to her now. Maybe I should hold on to it until it can play with it at home. Hello, boy. Have a good day. Yeah, mine was lousy, too. You know what they all think I am, Attila? A number one jerk. And they're right. What a job title, huh? George P. Hanley. Jerk. Take it easy. There's nothing to worry about in the package. Come on, I'll show you. See? It's only a box with a beaten up old lamp in it. A magnificent antique. Yeah, right. Probably came from a junkyard. Well, if being a jerk is my calling in life, at least I'm good at it. Look, it's so tarnished it's almost black. That's telling him. Well, let's clean it up and see what it looks like. I'll just use my necktie. It needs to be dry cleaned anyway. What in the... Easy, Attila. <laughs> oh, boy. Some special effects, huh? That smoke's hard on the old mucous membranes. You wouldn't have some visine on you, would you, buddy? Who? Who are you? Who am I? You were expecting Rex Ingram. I'm the genie of the lamp, that's who. You know, Aladdin, the whole bit. Don't you watch the late show? A genie? You don't look like a genie. Where'd you get that plaid suit? What difference does it make? The routine's the same. A couple thousand years ago, I had to wear those crazy balloon long johns and a real wild turban. But let me tell you, that headgear ain't as light as it looks. Give you a real crook on the neck, know what I mean, Jack? George. My, my name's George. Jack, George, whatever. What I was gonna say is, nowadays we dress hip. Except for these velvet slippers with the curly toes, my one concession to Squaresville. Now, where was I? What do you mean? Sports coats like that went out in the 60s. They did, huh? Well, what do you expect? Know how long I've been in there waiting for somebody to call me? Better pick up some new threads. You got a Ziedler and Ziedler around here, maybe a side of all, you know, someplace happening? But if you're the genie, that means I'm... The... the master of the lamp. So you're the master of the lamp. Big deal. Ah, uh, uh, give me a match so I can light this cigar before I give you your free wish. I, I thought there were three wishes. Ah, there's the rub. There used to be three, but let me tell you something, Jack. George. George, the scene used to include three wishes, but people started abusing the privilege, so we had to cut back. You get enough headaches with one wish, let alone three. So, think it over and give me a call. But do me a favor, sleep on it. Why? You know the routine, the wish comes true, blah, blah, blah. But once you make the wish, that's what you gotta live with. Could you, um, <laughs> could you make yourself available for consultation? Look, Jackson, how am I supposed to know what you want? You and me just met. Well, uh, at least tell me, what is it that people usually wish for? <sighs> Listen, Herbie, whatever your name is, it's enough to make you blush some of the stuff they ask for. Money, precious jewels. That's not so bad. Not so bad? Think about it. So they get a lot of dough. There's the IRS, long lost relatives beating on the door. It's enough to flip you out of your gourd. So not wealth? Forget about it. Maybe love then? Love? You gotta be some kind of a kook. You call me after all this time and you wish for love? You don't wish for love, Chief. You make it. Then I don't know what it is I do want. If it isn't wealth or love... <laughs> like I told you, Johnson. Think it over. 
Drop it down the well and see if it splashes. But don't go rubbing the lamp every time you get ants in your pants. That puff of smoke tears up my sinuses. And the next time I make the scene for nothing, you've had it. Now hold on to the cigar for me. It's too close to smoke in there. No cross ventilation, know what I mean? No, but I can imagine. Till we meet again, Bubby. Like <laughs> later. If it's all the same to you, make it much later. Just once I'd like some other ample. All right, everybody. Places, places, everybody. This is a run-through. Stand-ins, please. Positions. Lighting. Lights on. Camera. Ready with a camera. Excuse me. Hey, buddy. Don't you know this is a closed set? It is. Who let you in here? They said it would be all right. I'm, I'm George Hanley. Who? Her husband. Uh, Miss Alexander's, I mean. Oh, yeah. Haven't seen you around here in a while. It's been months, actually. Well, this is the big one, huh? I beg your pardon? The last shot of the picture. Once we get this one in the can, it's a wrap. It is? Say, can I ask you a question? What's that? What's it like being married to her? Well, I... I don't really know. That is, I... Man, I sure wish I was you. You do? I mean, lucky stiff. Yeah, I mean, yes. I guess I am. Uh, where is she, by the way? And? In makeup, where else? There. Here's the mirror, Miss Alexander. Well? I suppose it'll have to do. I blended the MAC lip gloss with the NARS shadow for an ultra-moist look. Isn't it ravishing? Can't you do something with this hair? My bangs are drooping. Certainly, Miss Alexander. Where's my blow dryer? Ready on the set, Anne. Yes, yes. That'll have to do, Skippy. There. Perfection. Leave us, please. Of course, Miss Alexander. Which scene is this? Well, this is your entrance into the city on the shoulders of Nubian slaves. Just the close-up where you wink. Hmm. What's my motivation? Oh, to rule, my dear, with him at your side. Got it? Just remember, you love this guy so much, your guts do a loop-de-loop -loop every time he creeps up on you. He's big. He's manly. He wears a leather skirt. Well, tell him to oil it, will you? He screws up my lines every time he moves. Not a problem. Props! Get me some WD-40! Now! Anne? Darling! Hello, dear. My, you look lovely. Good enough to kiss. Not now, Georgie. You'll smear my lipstick. Uh, this is the final scene, isn't it? <sighs> it's been such a long grind. It sure has. They said you could take a few weeks off, but that was six months ago. We can still take our honeymoon. That is, if you want to. Do I? Careful with the hair, Georgie. Sorry. They don't pay me to look ugly, sweetiekins. Besides, anticipation is the real joy. Isn't that what they say? They haven't been waiting for six months to take the most beautiful woman in the world on her honeymoon. Places, people! This one's for real! It won't be much longer, I promise. Just think. No more crawling into bed with a script so you can study your lines half the night. After today, no more getting up at 4.30 in the morning to go to the studio. And when we get home, you can take a nice hot bath. Maybe even let me wash your back. And then first thing tomorrow, we leave on our cruise. But darling, have you forgotten? Forgotten what? The rap party, here on the set. There'll be a million photographers. There's no point in going home. Not tonight. Not tonight, huh? Sure. Sure, Anne. I, I understand. Hi. Hello there. No, no, no champagne. Thank you. Excuse me. Has anyone seen... George Boy! Hiya, Mr. Watson. Call me Eli. Hey, listen, George. I, I want to talk to you. Anne said something about your needing a vacation. Not me. Her. Both of us together. I'm not going to mince words. I want Anne to star in my next picture right away. It's a guaranteed smash. Not a chance. What's the matter? Money? Okay. I'll double her salary. It's not the money, Mr. Watson. It, Eli. You see, it's our honeymoon. Great! I'm shooting on location. Make a great honeymoon trip. First class hotel, all the trimmings. Some honeymoon. Out of bed before the sun comes up, work all day, study her lines all night. 
In the last six months, the only times I've seen her when she wasn't asleep, she was either covered with makeup or she had so much cold cream on she would have squeezed right out of my hands and stuck to the ceiling. Listen, boy, she's a star. How would you like to see her with bags under her eyes? I'll take her any way I can get her. My boy, you want the world's most beautiful woman. You've got to share her with the world. I've been doing that. Now I want the world to share her with me. Son, it's not for myself, but no Anne, no movie. You know how many good people will hit the unemployment line? Actors, grips, prop men. They've got wives and sweethearts, too. They've got little ones. They've got mortgages and sports cars to pay for. Can't you get another star? Not like Anne. Millions of plain folks all over the world wait for her pictures. Little kids count their pennies. Mothers go without lunch. Brave men sacrifice the tiny luxury of a cigarette just so they can buy a ticket and escape the drab drudgery of an uncaring world just by watching Anne up there on the silver screen. Really? For them, George, the salt of the earth. Can't you find it in your heart to make this one little sacrifice? Uh oh well, Mr. Watson, if you put it that way... I'll tell her she can do the picture. It'll be tough, but we'll get through it together. Good. You tell her. She's right over there. Roger. Roger. Good news. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to make an announcement and a toast to the brightest star, the most exciting leading lady, the loveliest woman in the world who has just agreed to star with me in Eli Watson's new film, Beowulf. The greatest epic ever made. Oh. You sure travels fast. Oh, there you are, George. How about a photo, Miss Alexander? Miss? Look this way. Smile, please. How about one more? I... I'm, I'm her husband. Oh, the two of you this time. Put your arm around. How about a kiss? A kiss? Sure. Watch my hair, darling. Move right in, Roger. Put your arm around her. Excuse me, George. You don't mind, do you, old boy? I think I need a drink. Champagne? Hors d'oeuvres? Right here. Of course, sir. <sighs> Hit me again. Twice. Two more champagne, sir? Yeah, this one's for my wife. I'll take them to go. <laughs> Excuse me. If I could just get through here. Anne? Anne, don't you think it's time to go home? Anne, wh where are you? Yeah, she went that way. I don't think they want to be disturbed, though. What? Anne? Aren't you glad you stayed tonight? Don't be so egotistical. I had to be here. Sometimes I don't understand you. You're not supposed to. That's a woman's prerogative. I know, but why... what's his name? George? He's the perfect husband. That absurd little mouse? Why do you keep him around? A handy excuse when I need one, and when I don't, no problem. Hmm. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll spoil your makeup. Oh, who cares? Mm. <laughs> Anne, your lipstick. George, are you still here? Sorry, old boy. Just congratulating my co-star. I think we'd better be going. You go ahead. You should be home anyway to feed Attila. Attila? Yes, George, and he needs his walkies. Do be a dear. You want me to go home because of Attila? Be a good boy and run along. Roger will drive me home later. Won't you, Roger? With pleasure. But Attila's a dog. Aren't I more important to you than Attila? I mean, Attila? Attila? What? What? Attila, Attila, is that you? Oh, phew. What a dream. Oh, boy. Yeah. You know something, Attila? That's the trouble with a guy like me. Having something I want that much only means that it hurt that much more when I lose it. If I had a wife like that, well, I would lose her. Might as well face it. You still love me, don't you? Thanks, boy. Well, at least this makes the choice a little easier. Now I've only got to choose between the two other things I've always wanted. Money and power. Morning, Georgie. Morning. Well, today's the day, huh? For what, Raj? <laughs> For what? <laughs> Will you listen to this guy? Watson. Has he said anything about the promotion yet? Oh, the promotion. Forgot. <laughs> he forgot. 
Roger, Mr. Watson would like to see you in his office. Well, George, this could be it. You wanted to see me, sir. He'd never pick him. Never. Hey, George, the old boy wants you to double-check these entries. I did that already. It's a waste of time. Look, how much do we make a week? Well, look at this account. The guy makes so much dough, he sweats more than that every time he ties his shoelaces. So waste a little time, all right? My gosh, net worth $260,832,461. What would it be like to have all that money? Here we are, sir. The George P. Hanley building. Thank you, Roger. Will you be wanting me for lunch, sir? I, I can't say. Wait, just in case. Of course, sir. <laughs> Not now, Attila. I've no time to play. Sorry, Mr. Hanley, I couldn't hold him. Take him over to 21. Have the chef pick him out a nice prime rib. Not too fatty. Yes, sir. Then trot him around the block a few times. Keep up the pace. Right away. Here, boy. Paper! Get your morning paper! How old are you, son? Nine, sir. Nine? I see you every morning. Aren't you missing school? Oh, no, sir. I wouldn't miss school. I get up at five for my papers, and then I go over to PS31 for the afternoon session. Incredible. What about your parents? My mom is dead. My old man had a store, but it went broke. Sorry to hear that. I'll have a paper. Golly, I can't change a hundred dollar bill. I didn't expect you to, son. Gee, thanks. Good morning, sir. AT&T's up seven points in the morning ticker. Glad to see you back. Thank you, Miss Alexander. How was the Riviera? Oh, all right, I guess. Kind of like a suburban tract with castles. I see. Well, sir, shall I send in your first appointment? Might as well get started. Mr. Hanley will see you now. Watson? What are you doing here? A begging again, I'm afraid. These days, a college president has to worry more about salesmanship than scholarship. Then you came to the right place. Hanley, you've already done more for your alma mater than we have a right to ask. How much? Just enough to start the ball rolling for the alumni. Don't be coy, sir. Give me an amount. Altogether, ten million. If you could possibly start us off with, say, oh, one or two hundred thousand. Done. You're a generous man, GP, but... You've made a mistake. This is the entire sum. Don't worry. It's deductible. Besides, I want you to have it. Well, so would others, GP. Thousands of alumni not as successful as you. Giving, sharing the burden, and the satisfaction. It's the cement which binds them to our institution. I only wanted to help. I can't accept this. Send me a check for, oh, a few hundred thousand. Very kind of you. Don't mention it. Miss Alexander will show you out. Oh, nonsense. I know the way by heart. Send in the next one. Right away, sir. Hello, Masters. Well, Mr. Hanley, ready to add to the old empire? I suppose so. I brought along a few new catalogs. I thought I already owned one of everything ever made. Can't keep up with Yankee productivity. We have to buckle down and do some serious spending. Is that really necessary? If we don't, the government's liable to invent a new tax bracket just for you. Now, here we have an attractive little yacht. Already have one. A 94-foot job up at Newport. This one makes it look like an absolute dinghy. You know, Masters, there's no fun left in buying things anymore. Once I looked forward to a second-hand car like a kid waiting for Christmas. Now there's no anticipation, no hunger. Oh, perk up. I used to enjoy the little things. An ice cream cone, a ball game, going out for a walk in the park. Now people run up and ask if I'm going to subdivide it. No, no, I've had it. Sir, that's un-American. Think of all the men living on blue sky and a prayer who depend on you for their daily commissions. They have little ones, mouths to feed. Mr. Hanley, you can't stop buying. Please see yourself out, Master. If you're absolutely positive, sir. Out! 
I don't know who let them in, Mr. Hanley. That's all right, Ed. Why, hello, son. Is this the man? Yes. Here's the C-note. Awful sorry. What else did he lift? I don't know what you're talking about. I told you, Pop. He gave it to me. You gave my boy a hundred dollar bill? He's a fine lad. Listen, you fathead. Know where I found him? Trying to lay the whole hundred on a two-horse parlay, Herbie Boy, and War Biscuit. But what about the newspapers? Five o'clock in the morning... How can I teach the kid the value of a buck if you toss C-notes around like they grow on trees? I was only trying to help. If I ever catch you giving dough like that to my kid again, I'll bust you right in the chops. Millions or no millions? You're a man of integrity, sir. I congratulate you. Congratulate... Congratulate me. George, I said congratulate. Congratulate? You're looking at the new head bookkeeper. Hey, way to go, Rog. Speech, speech. Thank you, thank you. But the first thing I want to tell you guys is I intend to keep my vow. From now on, no more lousy lunches at Nick's. <laughs> Can't believe it. He wasn't even a good chauffeur. Easy, Attila. You're wearing me out. Sit here for a minute. Well, boy, we're down to the last choice. I could never hold on to a beautiful wife. And money's no fun. Maybe power. That's what makes the world go round. Look at the way Mr. Watson gave that promotion to Roger. Believe me, if I had power, I'd be fair. Here, sir. This copy and this... Uh, just your initials on that page. Mr. President, you can't sign any more bills today. You're exhausted. Watson, the people elected me. They placed their individual destinies in my humble hands. I can't betray them. In that case, they're getting the best in leadership. The very best. Sir, the congressman is waiting. Send him in. Mr. President, this pension legislation will tear the party in two. If you let it come to the floor, I, for one, won't get a single vote in November from anyone over the age of ten. Check with the majority leader. See if he can kill it in committee. Yes, sir. Right away. Yes? The situation in Asia is fraught with tension, Mr. President. We're not getting enough intelligence down there. Have the CIA prepare a full study. Your appointment schedule, Mr. President. Thank you, Sam. Move the press conference to after lunch. I need a haircut. For the UN speech, have someone whip up a draft. Tell him I need jokes. Yes, sir. Who are Sonny and Mickey? Those scrub scouts who wrote the letter about citizenship. You asked to be reminded when they arrived in the Capitol. I know there's no time. Make time. The boys and I can get haircuts together. Pass this on to the Secretary of Defense and market expedite. Save this for the Economics Advisory Council. Top priority. On the double, sir. <sighs> decisions, decisions, eh, Attila? Mr. President, I had to see you. Who let you in here, woman? I hid in the building all night. Don't send me away. I'm down on my knees. Kindly get up. How can I help you? It's my grandson. He's just a boy of 18. He fell asleep on guard duty, and they said it was treason. They're going to hang him. Easy, ma'am. He's in the service? Special duty at a missile base. Serious offense. Only a presidential pardon can save him. Please, sir, he's a good boy. Just a little tired. It could happen to anyone. Indeed, it could. Then you'll do it? You'll pardon him? Ma'am, the world will little note nor long remember what I say here. But this nation, this government, and its president are no more and no less than people. Of, by, and for them. Freedom is our battle cry. Justice and mercy our glory. Tell your son when you see him tomorrow that I'll have the Attorney General prepare an order for executive clemency. Bless you, Mr. President. You're a great man. Here, Attila. Up on my lap. Mm. You know, I think we found our niche. Who said power was hard to handle? All you have to know is how to use it, right, boy? It couldn't wait, Mr. President. What couldn't wait, General Hackett? It's the hotline. Red alert. Red? You mean the missiles? Yes, sir. They're on their way. What do we do? The decision is up to you, sir. The world's about to go up in one big poof. What do you say? Counterattack? How about a staff study? It's too late. Call in the Secretary of Defense. No time. You have ten seconds, sir. It's up to you. I, I can't. L let someone else decide. I, I don't want to decide. N not me. Not me. 
Not me. Not me. No! Not me! Not, not, not... Yeah, you, Mac. You and your mutt get off my stoop. Oh. I, I must have dozed off. Come on, dog. Let, let's go home. Well, Attila, we've got a magic lamp waiting for us back at the apartment. Anything I want, just for the asking, and I can't even figure out what to wish for. I never even thought it through until now. You know something? No matter what I wish for, it won't change a thing. I'll still be me, George P. Hanley. Vocation, jerk. What's that quote? The fault, dear Attila, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Ourselves, huh? That's it! Come on, Attila. We're gonna show that bored old genie a thing or two. We're gonna wish for something original. I'm tired. I wanna go to bed. I had a little drink about an hour ago. Oh, hold on. Let's see. Uh, uh, what's in my dumpster? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, for this. It's a kind of brown metal thing. It looks like a, like a spittoon. Gold? Ah, brass probably. Let me shine it up. Yeah. Hey, it's glowing. What the? Yes, master. Hey, where'd you get the funny pajamas and and the headpiece? They're traditional. <clears throat> I am the genie of the lamp. Your wish is my command. When you have made your wish, you must return the lamp to this alley so that others may find it. Keep your turban on straight, Attila. Now then, <clears throat> as I was saying, I am at your service, sir. Mr. George P. Hanley. Former vocation, jerk. Present vocation, genie. Once a most ordinary man, treated without deference, honor, or respect. But a man finally wise enough to decide on a most extraordinary wish that makes him the contented, permanent master of his very own Twilight Zone. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Okay, everybody, listen up. Listen up, all right. I know it's late, and some of you have tests tomorrow. So I won't keep you too much longer, but I'd like to run the beginning of that last scene just one more time. I suck it. I suck Emily? It. Right, Mr. Galvin? Places for the top of Act 4, Scene 1, please. Hey, Diane. What? Do you want to get some coffee when this is over? Rick, we're not going to get out of here before midnight. And your point would be? Well, wait a second. Phil, you might want to be ready with the drop in case he decides to run the scene change. Okay. Run the top of the scene, please. Sound. Ready. Go. Thrice the brinded cat hath mewed. Thrice and once the hedge pig whined. Harp your cries, tis time, tis time. So, uh, coffee? Oh, no, why not? I won't be sleepy till... Hey, hey! What's the matter? Ah, ow, ow! Don't grab that bare-handed! 
here, let me... It won't go anywhere now. Come over here under the light so I can see your hand. No, no, it's okay. But that line shouldn't have taken off like that. It's tied off. We'll check it later. Um, Diane, could you take him to the office? The first aid kit's I uh... don't need a... <laughs> oh, you were saying? Okay, uh, maybe, maybe a band-aid. Come on. <laughs> it hurts when I touch it. Huh. <sighs> Easier to see out here. Ow! Ooh, ooh, you did get a rope burn there, didn't you? Yeah, I, I guess so. Hey, uh, Mr. Galvin's not gonna be looking for you, is he? No, he's just running the witch's scene. Lady Macbeth's got nothing until- Oh! Didn't mean to startle you. <sighs> I didn't know you were here, Glenn. Came in at 11, same as always. What'd you do to your hand, Phil? Uh, grabbed a running line. Without your gloves? <laughs> well, everybody does it once. It's the ones who do it twice that you want to watch out for. Right. Good. That's it. We'll pick up from there tomorrow. Sounds like you're done. I'm just going to help Phil with his hand before we go. That's a good idea. All right, Toby. Just a few more minutes. Leave the office uh, open when, when you're finished, will you? It needs a good vacuuming like nobody's business. <laughs> I will. Thanks. Come on, Toby. Hey, how do you suppose he got him to let him bring his dog to work? Well, he's been the janitor here since... Oh, since forever. That probably helps. And there's nobody else here most of the time. No need for that. She means well, just doesn't know as much as she thinks she does, that's all. All right, hold still just a second. I'm almost done. All right, uh, I guess we're finished. Six o'clock call for tomorrow, um, and as soon as your hand's wrapped up, you can go home, Phil. Unless you want to grab some coffee with us. Thanks, but I better just go home and get some sleep. Hey, do you want to come in early tomorrow? Ah! Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. I just wanted to make sure it was clean before I put the gauze on. Wait a second. Early? What for? Won't we have to reweight that line? No, no. I, I flew it in a couple of times. It's not off balance at all. It doesn't make any sense. How could it take off like that, then? There. Try bending your hand. That, that's good. Thanks. But the line. It's probably the jinx. Jinx? Wh what jinx? The jinx on Macbeth. It's... All right, you three. I need to clean up in here. Sorry. We're out of here. I'll tell you the story later, Phil. Good night, Glenn. Good night. <laughs> it's okay, boy. Like I said, she just doesn't know as much as she thinks she does. Now, let's get to work, hmm? End of rehearsal for a college production of Macbeth. The sets are built, the actors have learned their lines, and the director is finally starting to believe that the show's coming together. The playwright, of course, is absent. But if he were here, he might be tempted to offer a quote from another one of his plays and remind these students that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in their philosophies. A good idea to keep in mind, especially when the curtain is about to rise in the twilight zone. And now, the twilight zone and our story, And Cauldron Bubble, Starring Virginia Williams with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Well, hey, Phil. I wasn't sure I'd see you here today. 
Skip a scene shop class this week? I don't know how bad you have to be hurt to get away with that. <laughs> well, at least they found you a job you can do one-handed. Yep. I can splatter fake stone walls with the best of them. Hey, you. <laughs> Hi, yourself. We finished with the costumes a little early, and I thought... Hey, Rick, when you two are done, how about giving me a hand with this flat? Uh, sure, Alan. But only because you asked so nicely. Sorry, it's been a lousy day. What happened? I told you about my job, right? Uh, scanning medical records, right? Yeah, it's a great gig, good pay. Work your own hours, take extra time off for shows. So, what's the problem? The problem is somebody at the hospital figured out that they could buy some equipment, hire somebody to scan their own stuff, and take in work from other places besides. Man, this piece is heavier than it looks. Hey, uh, Diane, Lindsay, could you come here a sec? Yeah, sure. All right, one, two, three, and up. There we go. Thanks. Anyway, the scanning is going to be done in-house now, so they don't need me anymore. What are you gonna do? I don't know. I can't even think about looking for another job until after the show opens. And trying to find something that fits in around this schedule, well, you know what it's like. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna have my job much longer if my car doesn't quit acting up. Twice this week I've been late because it didn't want to start. You can't just throw a few creepy bits into a cauldron and whip up a car repair potion? <laughs> I wish. Only when I'm on stage. But thanks for the suggestion. Hey, hey, Diane, is that is that your jinx again? Ha! <laughs> the one on Macbeth? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, and don't start thinking about it now either, Lindsay. I swear, actors are the most superstitious people I know. <laughs> oh, and techies aren't superstitious? Go on stage and whistle, Alan. Yeah, I dare you. Hey, there's a reason for that, you know. Right, Rick? Right. The first people to fly scenery in theaters were actually sailors. They already knew how to work with ropes and pulleys, and they didn't have headsets in those days, so they used a different type of whistle to cue every line. And nobody else whistled backstage. Now, wouldn't you feel unlucky if somebody brought a set piece down on your head because you forgot that? Hey, aren't you supposed to be on my side? Always. I can tell you more about it at dinner. Come on, you guys. We got an hour and a half until call time. Who wants to go for Chinese food? Uh, I gotta go home, guys. If I don't have dinner with the parents at least one night a week, I won't need any jinxes to bring me bad luck. Believe me. Chinese sounds good to me. Yeah, me too. Got that last paycheck burning a hole in my pocket. Ah, so you're treating then. Uh, Phil, there's a whole lot of you that hasn't been wrapped in gauze yet, but that could change. Ow. Oh, here. There's still some Kung Pao chicken left. Oh, not for me, thanks. If I eat any more, I'll be able to fly the mane out just by leaning against the line. I think you're going to need a doggy bag, Diane. Make sure you don't call it that around Toby. He'd figure it was for him. <laughs> he's a smart dog, Phil, but I don't think he's that smart. I wouldn't bet against it. Have you ever seen him fetch tools for Glenn? He's the only dog I've ever seen who can tell a screwdriver from a crescent wrench. I've got a better one than that, Alan. Glenn had to come in during the day once, when somebody else was out, sick, and Toby came over to where he was working and scratched at the door, like he wanted to be let out. So? Our old dog did that, and he was so dumb he used to forget his name. So, Glenn tells him, I'm busy, go take a walk. And Toby goes to Glenn's toolbox, picks up a leash, and walks off with it in his mouth. He was still carrying it when he came back. I guess they both figured that if he had a leash, he didn't have to be on a leash. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't figure that guy out. I know he's been working at the school for a long time, but does anybody know what he did before that? Or anything about what he does when he's not at work? I keep forgetting, this is your first semester. You haven't had time to hear all of the stories yet. Some people say Glenn used to be a teacher somewhere, but he got tired of dealing with all the paperwork. Or that he was a roadie and all the partying finally caught up with him. Now that's something I'd love to see. Glenn partying, it boggles the mind. <laughs> but my favorite one is the one where he's writing romance novels under an assumed name and keeping the day job. Uh, the night job for the, uh, benefits. 
Oh, speaking of writing, Phil, I never got a chance to tell you about the jinx. Oh, here we go again. Oh, hush, Alan. Read a fortune cookie or something. Here's the thing, Phil. Shakespeare may have been a genius, but he wasn't above borrowing things here and there. He was a plagiarist? Mm, 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 mm. Ordinary writers are plagiarists. Shakespeare was, well... Shakespeare. <laughs> so when he wanted to borrow something, he did. I am shocked. Alan. She won't stop you now. I beg pardon. Oh, do go on. Thank you. Okay. It turns out that when he needed incantations for the witches in Macbeth, he lifted sections out of a 16th century book on Scottish witchcraft. All those speeches are really parts of spells. But what does that have to do with being a jinxed show? Magic is a lot like electricity, Phil. It's power. If a spell's done properly from beginning to end, the power is contained, focused. But if you just throw bits and pieces around with no real point to it and no direction, well, it's unpredictable. It's the difference between a light that comes up on cue and one that shorts out and arcs all over the place. See what I mean? Yeah, I, I think so. And the arcs are what brings the bad luck? Exactly. Every time Macbeth is performed, or rehearsed, or even read, uncontrolled power gets set loose. That's why some actors won't even say its name. They call it the Scottish play instead. Tell them what you're supposed to do if you do say it. Oh, you're making fun of me now. I just thought he'd want to hear it. Right. Well... I've never done it myself, but if you say Macbeth, you're supposed to spin in a circle three times, spit and swear. That takes the hoodoo off. <laughs> oh, that would make for a fun performance, wouldn't it? Tragedy, horror, spinning, spitting, swearing. And you wonder why I didn't mention it. Come on, I, you got to admit, babe, it sounds a little odd. Oh, of course it does. And useless, too. If you actually wanted to do some good, casting a protection spell would make a lot more sense. Um, no offense, but how do you know about this stuff, Diane? Well, my last roommate had a ton of books on magic. She left them when she skipped out on the rent. If you'd like to, I Better can... Better hold that thought. We've got to go soon, Lady Macbeth. Uh-oh. You know what I have to do now, don't you? <laughs> I know that if you do, I am going to take a picture and use it for my screensaver. Especially since you don't believe in any of this anyway. Hey, I'm not saying I couldn't be convinced. I just haven't been yet. Well, I hope this isn't the show that changes your mind. Me too. That's a cue, Phil. Let's get the check and head out of here before they realize they've stopped arguing. Rick, have you seen Lindsay? Uh, that's since before we left for dinner. She isn't in the green room? Not in the green room. Not in any of the dressing rooms. Not in the office. Mr. Galvin's going to want to call places as soon as the scenery is set and we're starting with her entrance. Hold on, j just a second. Has anybody seen Lindsay? Emily's looking for... Yeah, she's not up here. Sorry, nobody's seen her yet. Oh, this is going to be ugly. You know how Mr. Galvin gets when somebody's late. I sure do. I was late once, my first show, with Sir James Galvin, theater director par excellence. I thought he'd get me kicked out of school before he was done. Emily! Here we go. I hope he doesn't decide to shoot the messenger. Phil? Yes? The floor's clear. Go ahead and bring in the drop. Okay. He's not here! Oh boy. I think I'm going to find a set piece to hide under and stay there. Chicken. Rick! Did you know Lindsay's not She's not answering her cell. Try calling her parents. Maybe they know where she is. Oh, yeah. Everybody knows. I hope she's okay. Dan! Uh-oh. Yes, Mr. Galvin? Change of plans. We'll run through Lady Macbeth's speech from 1-5. Alan, bring out one of the chairs. And never mind about changing the set. I'm hoping we'll be able to get back on schedule after this.
All right, that's fine. All right, Diane, uh, from your entrance, go. They met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the perfectest report they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air into which they vanished. Mr. Galvin? While I stood... Stop! Emily, why would you... Emily, what's wrong? I didn't get an answer at Lindsay's parents, so I tried her cell again. Her father answered it this time. They're at the hospital with her in the emergency room. While she was on her way home for dinner, she got into an accident. Her car, her car stalled out in the middle of an intersection and she got broadsided by somebody trying to beat the light. Did they say how badly she was hurt? They think she's going to be all right. Her left arm's got a bad break and her mom says she's one big bruise. But it could have been a lot worse. All right. All right then. Uh, can I have everyone on stage, please? Quiet, please. Most of you probably just heard that Lindsay Morgan was involved in a car accident this afternoon. From what her parents told Emily, she should make a good recovery. However, I know that the show must go on is a cliche, but it's true all the same. Lorene. Yes, sir? You've been understudying Lindsay. Do you know Hecate's lines well enough to work off book? Um, sh sure. Uh, the rest of you can take a break while Laureen and I go over some of the blocking. Then we'll pick up where we stopped last night, at Hecate's entrance. We shouldn't be long. Rick, Alan, hey, can we go to the back office for a minute? Uh, sure. Is there something wrong? I don't... Are we going to the green room? I don't know, not right now. Come with us. What's going on? I'll tell you in a minute. Let's go. Diane? What? I'm still not sure I believe in jinxes, but it seems like something strange is going on here. Oh, good. The monitor's on. We'll be able to tell when they're done. Uh, babe, you want to tell us what this is about? Remember what I said about protection spells? Well, we need to cast one. And soon, before anyone else gets hurt. Settle down, Toby. It's still early. Don't you want your dinner? I know, I know. But there's time yet. Don't worry. I think we should do it tomorrow night if we can, before we get an audience in here. You're starting to weird me out a little, Diane. Phil, she might be right. What? Think about it. Lindsay could have been killed. Maybe somebody will be next time. There are a whole lot of things you don't want to have happen when you've got a stage full of people. Exactly. And that's another thing. If I am right, this is going to get even worse because the witches' scenes are going to be rehearsed so much more now with Laureen taking over Lindsay's part. Are you sure you can do this? Uh, cast a spell and make it work? I... Yes. Yes. If you'll help me. Uh, I don't know how much help I'll be, but I'm not going to let you try this by yourself. Count me in. Me too, then. But I'm still a little weirded out, you know? I know. Okay, I think they're finished. We'd better go. All we have to do is find a way to have the place to ourselves for a little while after the rehearsal tomorrow night. And it'll be okay. I I'm sure of it. Stop! 
Bring up the lights. What's wrong? Sorry, we were moving the castle stairs out and I think there's something jammed in the casters. Oh, for the love of... Can you see what it is? Uh, it's somebody's sword. Well, it was. I, I mean... Can you move the unit now? Yes, sir. All right, get it into place. Rick. Yes, Mr. Galvin. Bring the drop in. And then I want everyone to stop whatever they're doing and listen for a minute. I'm glad I'm not the one who dropped that sword. Well, I don't know how anybody could have dropped it. What do you mean? People, I'm assuming that you're all aware that tomorrow night's our dress rehearsal. That means we have exactly two more chances to get through this show, including tonight, before we do it in front of an audience. Is there anybody here who thinks we're ready? Nobody. Well, that makes it unanimous. Look, I went as easy on everyone last night as I could. We were all distressed by what happened to Lindsay. But we're running out of time here. So I'm telling you, start paying attention and get it together. Because if I have to choose between postponing the opening and letting you embarrass this department with a lousy performance, I know what the choice is going to be. And if it comes to that, you're all going to wish you'd gone to a nice trade school instead. Do I make myself clear? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. We'll pick up where we stopped. Emily? Places for the top of 5-1. Light 78. Stand by. And go. I have two nights watched with you. But can perceive no truth in you. That sword shouldn't have been there. When was I think it? everybody would agree with you. Locked. No, that's not what I mean. Majesty. They're only brought out for the fight scene. I have Mr. Galvin insisted. Rise from her bed. Throw her nightgown upon her. Unlock her closet. Well, somebody must have been goofing around. It couldn't have gotten there all by itself, right? I don't think I have an answer to that. Well, not one I want to think about right now, anyway. And besides, we have to talk about it later. My entrance is coming up. Just go out there and break a leg, then. But not really, okay? Huh? I'll do my best. All right, don't move. Everyone stay right where you are. Should have backup lights in just a moment. There, can you all see? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Good. Yes, sir. I, I'd say what else could go wrong if I weren't so afraid I might find out. So, here's what we're going to do. There's just the rest of the scene left and we're done. We're going to have an early call tomorrow and finish it before we start the dress rehearsal. Be here at five. Whatever the problem with the power is, it should have been taken care of by then. Let us hope. Do we need to let Glenn know before he comes in? I don't think he'll bother coming in when he sees that the power's off, do you? Well, just put any props you have out away. Leave everything else as it is. That'll save us a little time tomorrow. Be careful on your way out, everyone. And do I really need to say, be on time tomorrow. Rick, I'm gonna wait behind the castle drop. Can you catch up with Phil and Alan and bring them back here? I think we finally caught a break, if nobody notices that we've stayed. Well, I don't think we'll get a better chance than this. Okay, but be quiet. Mr. Galvin may come back through to make sure everybody's gone. Hey, guys. Have you seen Mr. Galvin? Oh, yeah. He said something about making sure we closed the door behind us and took off. I think he had had it. Oh, so we're the last ones here. Yeah. Oh, we hadn't seen you or Diane, so we figured you must still be back here. Okay, let's get started. I want the power going out to be the last shot that Jinx gets at us. Sounds good to me. What do we need to do first? I brought this book. I need more light. 
and we have to get enough room to stand in a circle. L let's go further downstage. Okay, this is good. In a circle, about an arm's length apart. Just one thing. Will this take very long? I mean, what if somebody comes in to check on the power, then- Don't worry, we should be done and out of here without anyone having a clue. Alan, could you just move a little closer to Phil? There, that's better. <sighs> Everyone needs to focus. To think about surrounding the theater and everybody in it with a white light that nothing bad can pass through. Just keep that image in your mind while I'm reading, okay? Okay. Here we go, then. Spirits of air, grant us your protection. Spirits of earth, shield us with your strength. Spirits of water, make all that would harm us flow by. Spirits of fire, wrap us in the safety of your flames. Wait, did you hear that? Shh, not now, if we don't do it the way... Quick, get off the stage. Now. Diane, look out! Ah! Ow. Come on, oh. babe. You've got to get up. Ow. We need to get out of here. I... I... I can't. It's all right, Diane. We'll help you. You can do it. Oh! Diane, something really oh. bad is happening. We can't stay here. My side hurts. I think she's bleeding. Oh, ow. We'll, we'll, we'll have to carry her then. We'll, we'll, let's just pick her up. Ow, and... ow, 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 hey, hey, ow. hey, the lights are... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh! Yes, Toby, you're right. It is a mess. Glenn? How did you... Later, Rick. But... but right you... now, there's some cleaning up to do. <laughs> but, Glenn... Have a little patience, Rick. That's half your trouble, all of you. Not an ounce of patience among you. What have you been up to, Diane? Hmm? Glenn, I got hurt. Yes, I can see that. Looks as though a piece of that wall flat caught you on the side when you fell. Glenn, can you help us get her to a hospital? No need for that. Just... There. What do you mean? She's... What was that? Easy, easy. It doesn't hurt now, does it? No, no... No, it doesn't. She must be going into shock. We need... Silence! I'm sorry, I just don't have time to argue right now. Come on, Toby. What was that all about? I couldn't talk. Couldn't make a sound. Rick, could you help me up, please? No. Babe, don't try to stand up. But I'm fine. See? A little quiet, please. Thank you. All that is broken, be whole again. <gasps> Look at that. It's all going back together. What, what is this? Magic. No, it's really magic. All that has fallen, rise. It really is. All that has been disturbed, return to your proper place. And all that is unwanted here, be gone. So is my will, so mote it be. Thank you, Toby. That was just the extra push it needed. Nasty stuff, wasn't it? It really is. Uh, Glenn? Oh, yes. 
You had some questions, didn't you? Well, I have a few to ask you first. It's really not, I mean... Let's go sit down. There's nothing more to do here. And this could take a while. That's all I was trying to do. I just didn't want anybody else to get hurt. But you haven't learned enough yet to protect yourself, much less anyone else. No. Overreaching. Everybody does it once. It's the ones who do it twice that you want to watch out for. I'll remember that. <laughs> no, you won't. But that's all right. Uh, Glenn? Who are you? Really, I mean... I'm a janitor. Among other things. What other things? Not a romance writer, I'm guessing. Is that the story they're telling now? <laughs> well, I've been accused of worse. Glenn, seriously. Seriously? Oh, why not? It won't matter anyway. I'm a magician. A wizard. A warlock. Whatever you want to call it, Diane, that's, that's what I am. And have been for a very long time. I've learned to adapt to my uh, station in life. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, a wizard? It just sounds unbelievable. Does it really? After what you've seen tonight? He has a point, Phil. Okay, but you have these, let's call them powers. We've all seen them. Why would you waste your time working here? I mean, you could do anything. You think so? Sure, why not? <sighs> because there's no such thing as magic. What? But you... That's what everyone says now, isn't it? Magic? That's something you go to Vegas to see. Or to the movies. Something you read about in children's books. If it's something real you're after, they go to a scientist. An astronomer. A physicist. It's only the scientific marvels that matter now. The age of magic has passed. <coughs> Hush, Toby. A man's entitled to a good grouse every century or so. Every... Every century? Glenn, how old are you? Old enough to have seen Shakespeare's plays when they opened. And to have been written into his last one. You're 400 years old? Nearly five. And you know, I still haven't forgiven that wretched scribbler for what he did to me. Not that it wasn't my fault, too. Vanity. All vanity. I knew who he was. And was dumb enough to be flattered when he sought me out. Someone had told him that if he was going to write about trafficking with spirits, he should talk to me. And fool that I was, I helped him. Then I went to the first night of the Tempest and saw myself on the stage. You're... You're Prospero? Oh, he used another name, I'll give him that. But no one who knew me could have mistaken that character for anyone else. I left the city the moment the curtain went down and never returned. It wasn't easy, but I did it. Made a new life in the colonies. Kept to myself and moved on often enough that no one got suspicious. And I'm not ready to do it again just yet. So we have a little problem, don't we? Uh, no, no problem. He, he's, he's right. We wouldn't tell anyone. You would, though. Sooner or later, you wouldn't be able to help yourselves. You're not going to turn us into toads or anything, are you? <laughs> Magic is the same as any other kind of power. You don't use any more of it than you need to get the results you want. Totes. Well, what are you going to do? Just a little thing. Forget. <coughs> and what are all you doing here? Aren't you done for the night? Uh, we are... But... But what? Well, we had to come back to, um, to... To what? I, I don't remember. Yeah, me either. It couldn't have been too important then, could it? No, I, I guess not. So why don't you clear out and let me get to work here? I'm already behind from having to wait for the power to come back on. I wonder what... Huh. Huh? Oh, well... <laughs> Good night, Glenn. Good night.
Toby, I think we've done a good night's work already. What do you say we do this the easy way? Just this once. <coughs> There, clean as a whistle. Let's go. Exit stage right, a janitor and his faithful dog. Both good actors who know very well how to play the parts the world around them expects and how to slip into very different roles when a casting call comes from the Twilight Zone. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Minus one minute. Count off. Pearson? Here, sir. Corey? Corey here, sir. Hudak? All strapped in, ready to go. Foster? Ready as I'll ever be, Captain. Nolan? Let's light the fuse and go. I second that motion, Captain. Take it easy, Pearson. This isn't a bottle rocket. We're gonna fly higher than anybody's ever flown before. Everyone clear on that? Clear, Captain. Loud and clear. Fire it up. Come on, I got a hot date. Let's get this show on the road. Something tells me we're gonna go on a long, long trip. Just do it, the suspense is killing me. Arrow One, come in, Arrow One. This is Arrow One, that you, Brandt? Affirmative, Captain Donlin. We read you loud and clear. Well, do we have a go? Weather's holding. Time for a system check. We already did that. Give it to us one more time. On your mark. Fuel supply. Fuel check. Computer presets. Computer check. Air supply and life support. Life support check. Flight plan trajectory. Flight plan check. Autopilot. Autopilot check. System coordinates. All systems check. Looking good, Captain. You've got to go. Crew, stand by. Hey, I changed my mind. I think my mother's calling me. I gotta go to the bathroom. Fire rockets. We have ignition. Cleared for takeoff, Arrow One. Prepare for countdown. Ready for countdown. T minus 15. Minus 14. Lock those seat belts, boys. Hey, I forgot to bring my lunch. Where's my lucky rabbit's foot? Do they have TV in space? We're gonna miss a World Series. Minus 10. Take a deep breath, everybody. Minus 9. You want we should hyperventilate? Minus 8. Captain, Captain, I need a drink. Minus seven. No more chatter. Minus six. Anybody bring a magazine? Minus five. I gotta finish my crossword puzzle. Minus four. Don't I get a last cigarette? Minus three. Wait, 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 I forgot to lock the door. Minus two. Cut it, I said. Minus one. Somebody tell my wife I love her. Aw, oh, ain't that sweet? Last off. Hang on. This is it. Her name is the Era One. She represents four and a half years of planning, preparation, and training, and a thousand years of mathematics and the projected dreams and hopes of not only a nation, but a world. You might say that all of human history has led to this point, with man poised to take one giant step off terra firma and into the void, the unknown that lies beyond the safety of the nest. Because she is the first manned craft aimed into deep space, beyond the moon to other worlds that until now have been the exclusive province of science fiction writers 
and those given to imagination without bounds. For her hand-picked crew, this has been the ultimate countdown, the last few seconds before humanity takes its best shot and fires a tall silver arrow into the air. But you know the saying about the best laid plans of mice and men. In just a moment, this ship will veer off course and into a region not on any star map for an unscheduled landing in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, I Shot an Arrow into the Air, starring Chelsea Ross with Stacey Keach as your narrator. All right, roll call, sound off. Nolan here, Pearson, anybody got an Alka-Seltzer? Foster, make it a promo. Corey here, Kodak, look at me, I'm flying. How you doing, Colonel? I am A-OK. -okay. We all are, and so's the ship. Are we there yet? We're leaving the Earth's gravitational field. Instruments all in the safety zone. Pearson, give me a visual scan. Yes, sir. Everything's on the money, Captain, far as I can see. Cabin pressure? Uh, 1.19, sir. Disengage restraints. You can remove your helmets now. We're free to move around. Got <laughs> 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 it. I feel more like I do now than I did when I got here. Nolan, switch on the view screen. There she is, Captain. Wow. Will you look at that? Is that talcum powder? Or stars? Never saw so many in my life. Quite a sight, huh? We're almost clear of the Earth's atmosphere. Where is the Earth, anyway? It's down there. Hey, question. Which way is up and which way is down? Watch the lower edge of the screen. It should come up any time now as our trajectory shifts. It'll be the blue one with clouds, about the size of a quarter from this far out, but we'll be able to see it. What are those blips? Where? The ones moving toward us. We've entered the asteroid belt. But don't worry, they're miles apart. The odds of hitting one are infinitesimal. Mission control to Arrow 1. Come in, Arrow 1. Roger, Mission Control. Got you on the monitor, center screen, right on course. Just like a Sunday ride in the country. Any snafus down there? That's a negative, Arrow One. Hold on, Captain. Someone wants to talk to you. Standing by. I just want to say how proud we are of you, Donlan. You and the entire crew. That's you, General Langford? That's right, Bob. How does it feel to make history? I couldn't say, sir. We're only doing our job. Sure you are. Make it sound so simple. The president will be sending you a live message at 1400 hours. Till then, keep your eyes on the prize. You can't express how proud I am of all of you. Thank you, sir. First, keep space. Every American. What's that, sir? You're breaking up. I say, in the world. First, broke. General? General, we're losing you. What's going on? Some kind of interference. Look, Captain. What? The stars are moving. We must be turning. Not this early. Did you punch in a course correction? No, I didn't. General Langford, we have rotation here. Kill then, signing off. Wait, the ship is yawing. That's not part of the flight plan. Have it to your course. Up the screen, get deep. Get back in your seats. We're turning faster. Now! Captain, what's happening? I said strap in. What about you? I'll try for a manual override. Captain, we're spinning. Lock your belts. I can't get in the chair. We're going into a dive. Zero G's. Hold on and pray. Vector 1-9. Triangulate with Sydney, Australia, and South Africa. We have no signal. We've lost it. Well, what do you mean, we've lost it? See for yourself, General. Good Lord, with 15 monitors going... We could have 15,000 monitors, but the situation would be the same. We've lost contact. Visual and radio? How is that possible? Don't ask me. She's off her vector path. I'll clean off the radar screen. Just gone. Completely gone. When did you first lose contact? A few minutes ago. There was a short period of heavy interference. What kind of interference? Probably solar. 
Some kind of sunspot activity. We haven't been able to identify it yet. In any case, when it was over, the contact was broken. Couldn't a change in their course account for that? The course was preset. The captain wouldn't change it without notifying us. Bob Donlin's a solid officer. And even if he did change course, the automatic tracking system would have been activated. It would show up here on the board. So a ship with an eight-man crew just disappears like a puff of smoke. One minute she's there, the next minute she's gone. That's not the worst part. What do you mean? Until we regain contact, if we do, there's not a thing anybody can do for them. I shot an arrow into the air. It landed I know not where. What say, General? A nursery rhyme for the age of space. Gentlemen, wherever you are, may God help you. Contact the observatory. There's no readings. It's flat. She's gone. Captain Donlin? Go on, get out of here. I can't find my helmet. Forget your helmet. Go. My God, look at Grimes. Anderson, and Nolan, and Foster. Help me. It's Hudak. He's still alive. Here, take his legs. Now lift his head. What are you doing, Captain? Gotta drag the bodies out. But the fuel tanks are gonna blow. Hold on, we'll give you a hand. Somebody, please. Get him out, I said. That's an order. I think that's all of them. That's all of them, Captain. All right. Now, check the forward hold. The fire's spreading. We have to try and get the supplies out. Yes, sir. The others are all dead, sir. Except Hudak. How bad? He's still conscious. He keeps drifting in and out. We should have gotten the supplies out. We did the best we could. We should have done that first. We knew the ship might go up. So now, instead of food and water, we've got four dead men and another one dying. We didn't know they were dead, Corey. Well, knock it off, Pearson. Maybe when your tongue starts swelling up, you'll realize where we are. We're on a rock here. We blew it. We wasted all that time playing Undertaker instead of going in there and getting supplies. Let's cover them up. Pull something over their faces. Why bother? What's the point? You heard me. We'll take 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll bury them. Yes, sir. First entry. Log, Arrow 1. Captain R.G. Donlin commanding. The first leg of the flight went off without incident. Now we have crash-landed on what appears to be an uncharted asteroid. Cause of malfunction and ultimate crash, unknown. We lost our course, the electrical system went out, and there was an explosion. That's all any of us can remember. Any of us, being flight officers Corey and Pearson, and navigator Hudak, who has been seriously hurt, and myself. The rest of the crew are dead. There's very little left of the ship. The radio is gone, the bulk of the supplies were destroyed in the crash, and as of this moment, there is little certainty that we have been tracked and our whereabouts known. Begging the captain's pardon. What do you think you're doing? This is no time to write your memoirs. Stand down. Listen to me, Corey. We're in bad shape, but we're still a crew. As long as we're a crew, there'll be discipline and there'll be protocol. And until I'm lying in a hole like the rest of those poor devils, we'll operate from the book. Got it? I got it. Now give me the recorder. Go over there by the rock and sit down. Continuing this log entry. Commander Donlin, it's hot, see? It's very hot. Thank you for the information, Corey. And that makes it hard to think. So if you're going to expend all that energy, use it to figure a way out of here. A way to get back home. A way to let them know where we are. Corey, you stay out of this. You heard him. 
Go over there and sit down. You've got a bad cut on your forehead. Make a bandage and tie something around it. Okay. Okay. Something's wrong with Corey, sir. The bump on his head or whatever it was, he's not acting right. He's not the one I'm worried about just now. Hudak? Hudak, can you hear me? Sir? How about some water? Water? Please, sir. Thank you. How much is there? A five-gallon can and whatever we've got on us. Then why waste it? He won't last through the day. You the consulting surgeon, Corey? I'm one man out of three who's gonna need that water. And five gallons isn't gonna last very long. If the situation were reversed, Corey, if that were you lying there, I'll give you good odds you wouldn't want to get written off five gallons of water or no. He's going to die, Colonel. If he dies, he dies, Corey, but nobody gets behind to push. If he's thirsty, he gets water. If he's hot, we move him in the shade. And then if he goes, we'll give him a prayer or two. Right? If you say so. Pearson? Sir? There's a broken shovel near the packs. Let's dig the graves. I'll relieve you in five minutes, then Corey here will relieve me. Right away, sir. Captain? Yes, Pearson? That's odd. What is? The sun. Don't you think that's odd? The size of it, I mean? What? The size of the sun? It's hardly any different than we knew it on Earth. Same kind of star and almost exactly the same distance. Which means that whatever asteroid we've landed on is close to the Earth. How close? Huh. Pick a number. That's how it is, huh? A hundred thousand miles, two hundred thousand, maybe more, a lot more, who knows. Hard to say after we've blacked out, but wherever we are, it's a cinch it isn't heaven. We can count on that. Yeah, I guess we can, unless it's the other place. We can count on this, too. We've got maybe six, seven gallons of water and food concentrates for about four days, and that's it. So we'd better make our plans with that in mind. What kind of plans? We have to get our bearings and see what's here. Any water, plant life. We'll use this as a base and spread out in two-man patrols, one man to stay behind and watch Hudak. You think we'll find anything but rocks out there? At least we'll see what's on the other side of the rise. Look at it this way. We've got several things in our favor. The air is breathable, so we don't need suits and helmets. The gravity's close to Earth's, so moving around's no problem. No signs of animal life, friendly or unfriendly. And there's no radiation to speak of. You checked? The Geiger counter still works. I have to hand it to you, Colonel. That's what I call positive thinking. We don't have much of a choice. No, sir, I guess we don't. It took four and a half years to build that ship. There wasn't any prototype. Just the one, the only ship of its kind. So, if they know where we are and want to come get us, they've got to build another one. And that'll take another four and a half years. So I suggest we dig in and get comfortable. Because any way you look at it, we've got a devil of a long wait ahead of us. Pearson, your turn. Ah, how's it going, Pearson? That's the last grave, sir. Four of them. Well, good job. How is he? The same as when you left. Breathing pretty shallow, though. Maybe the air here, well, well maybe, it, maybe it doesn't have as much oxygen in it. It has enough. We're doing all right. You two see anything out there? <laughs> Nothing we can't see from here. Yeah, we saw something. Sand and more sand. Rocks. And those scrubby hills over there. But not a single drop of water. This isn't an asteroid, it's an eight ball. And hot, Pearson. Hot like nothing you've ever felt before. 
It'll be cooler at night, sir. I'll head south towards the mountains and take a look in that direction. If there is a night here... There has to be. The sun's moved down to the horizon. That you, Captain? Right here. What are you doing? Giving him his ration of water. Oh, no. Not this time. Corey, take your hand off my canteen. That's an order. Not this time, Colonel. What are you talking about? I want an even shake. I want a chance. You're alive, aren't you? That's a better shake than the men in those graves got. For now. But I want to stay alive. So don't give him any of my water. Your water? That's right. It's ours now. Stand down, Corey. You heard him. How are you doing, Hudak? Hot. So hot. Yeah, yeah. Here, take a sip of this. Let go of that. Get off me. I said leave it. Don't you ever raise your hand to me. I'm still the commanding officer here. Do you understand? Captain Donlan? What is it, Pearson? See for yourself, sir. I think he stopped breathing. You'll be pleased to hear, Corey, that he won't be drinking any more of your water. Pearson, get something to cover his face. Yes, sir. You died a long way from home, boy. A long, long way. Rest in peace. Wait till dark, and then we'll make some treks over the hills and down to the flats in all four directions. We better get to know it, because this is our home now, gentlemen. Such as it is. Corey, what are you doing? What does it look like? I'm taking his canteen off his belt. He can't use it. For the record, Corey, there's just three of us now. And the big problem is going to be staying alive. You hear me? The three of us! I'll carry the extra canteen. Something's wrong with you, Corey. I was gonna share it. Sure you were. Something's very wrong with you. Something happened to you when you hit your head in the crash. Okay, so you're not responsible for your actions anymore. But if I catch you filching just once, just once, Corey... Let it go. This dirty little grave robbing... I said forget it. Yes, sir. Now, let's all find a place in the shade and sit tight. For how long? Till the sun goes down. Watch your step. What's the difference? Can't see anything anyway. Use your flashlight. The batteries are going out. Turn it on and off in bursts. That way they'll last longer. You know, this is nuts. We're killing ourselves. For what? You got a better idea? Sure. Pack it in right now and head back to camp. We're on recon, Corey. Captain's orders. Well, I gotta stop for a minute. Hey, hey, hey. Take it easy with that canteen. <sighs> I'm thirsty. Well, so am I. Now listen to me. We'll need every drop of that water come morning. Right now we've got two choices. Either curl up and die out here, or keep moving. What's the point? We can't see where we're going. The mountains are getting closer. They don't even look real. There should be stars, lots of them, and a moon. Doesn't this place have a moon? It's the atmosphere. Some sort of cloud cover after the sun goes down. Where are you going? I'll peel off and head for the mountains. We'll rendezvous at base camp in two hours. Yeah, what am I supposed to do? Check out the flatland straight ahead. Think you can do that? Yeah, but if we split up... What? Well, we might not find our way back. Are you telling me you can't walk a straight line, Corey? There's the rise, directly behind us. If you get turned around, look for a light, okay? The captain will keep the fire going. Yeah, all right. Listen, soldier. For all I care, you can lie down and fry like a piece of bacon when the sun comes up. As far as I'm concerned, you're on your own. All right. If that's the way it is... Keep your sidearm loaded. What for? In case we're not alone on this rock, after all. Corey? Are you following me? Corey? If you're out there, something's very, very wrong with you. Pearson! Corey? Who's there? Identify yourself. What the?
Corey? <sighs> Hello, Captain. Well? I must have walked 12, 15 miles. Yes, and? Nothing. Not a thing. Sand flats. That's all there was. Just sand. One stretch after another. I thought I could get some kind of a fix from the stars, but it's overcast. I know. What about Pearson? What about him? You haven't seen him? Not for hours. You didn't pass him coming back? He went south to the mountains, and I went west toward... toward nothing. What time is it? Oh, three o'clock in the morning, or it would be on Earth. You kept the fire going. This is what's left of the flight chairs. There are some plastic panels scattered around. When that's gone, the only thing left to burn will be our suits. Fine with me. Not like we're going anywhere. He's been gone six hours. He should have been back by now. <sighs> Corey? Yeah? You're sure you didn't see him or hear him? I already told you, Captain. We went in different directions. Was it hot out there, Corey? You know it. The sand doesn't cool off much at night. And that made you thirsty, didn't it? All the time. I guess I'm getting used to it. Obviously. Very used to it. So used to it, Corey, that you didn't even need any of your water. I drank some. Hardly any. This canteen is almost full. You were out all those hours and you didn't touch more than a drop, is that right? That's pretty remarkable. Downright amazing, in fact. So put me in for a medal. Buddy, what I'm gonna give you can't get pinned on a uniform. Hey, what are you talking about? I wanna know why you started out six hours ago with half a canteen and then came back with it three quarters full. Hey, let me go! Come on, Corey, talk. I want to know where you left Pearson and what you did with him. Now! All right, all right. It was like this. I found him, face down. He must have... He must have fallen and hit his head on a rock. That's all I know. He was dead when I got there. And where did this happen? At the foothills. You followed him there? I, I went looking for him. Sand was too deep, heading west. I had to change directions. It's your story you'd better change. Captain, I swear I didn't touch him. He was dead already. I saw his canteen, and I poured his water into mine. I knew you wouldn't believe me. That's why I told you I hadn't seen him. What's that for? On your feet. We're going to bring him back. No, you're nuts. It's seven or eight miles from here. I can't make it again. I'm dead, Captain. Correction. You're almost dead. But you're not quite yet. Let's go, Corey. I want a conducted tour all the way to Pearson's body. I want to see for myself. Let's move out. I... I don't see him. No, neither do I. But I'm sure this is the place. I'm sure this is where he was. But he's not here now, is he? Just these marks in the sand. Captain, look. He must have crawled away. I thought you said he was dead. I was wrong. I, I must have been wrong. But you were so sure he was dead. You were so positive, Corey. I was. Did you do anything for him? Anything at all? Did you check his pulse? His respiration? Did you do anything to help him? I checked, I swear. Or did you just steal his water and then make a beeline back as fast as you could? You must have been hit hard in the head, pal. Real hard. It knocked more out than your senses. It turned you into an animal. Captain, please. I thought he was dead. I really did. But I was so thirsty. My tongue was swelling up. I swear on everything holy, my tongue was swelling up and I... Pearson! Pearson! It's Captain Donlan. Pearson, answer me. You can still see the tracks. It looks like he went that way. Pearson, I I'm here. You're going to be all right, Pearson. I'm coming. Don't worry, Captain. I'm coming too. <laughs> Pearson. Captain? Pearson, thank God you're alive. Water. 
I lost my canteen. Yeah, here, here. Take some of mine. Can't sit up. I'll lift you. Thanks, Captain. Not too fast. You're all right, boy. We'll take you back now. I don't know if I can walk. I'll carry you myself if I have to, but you're going to be all right. Captain. Captain. What, Pearson? What, what are you trying to say? I saw. I saw. What? What did you see? Where? Up there. Over the hill. Did you climb the hill? Is that it? I went. And what, Pearson? What did you see? Captain. Captain, I saw. What? Are, are you drawing a picture? You, you should have seen. You, you wouldn't believe it. What? No, Pearson. Sorry, Captain. Pearson. Come on, Pearson. Pearson, don't die on me. Don't. Is he gone? Ah, yeah. Yeah. He drew this in the sand first. Some kind of sign or symbol. What is it? It looks like a T, or maybe a, a cross. He was trying to tell me something. Well, it doesn't matter now. It might. What do you suppose he... Captain? Corey? Put the gun down. Captain, two men can live maybe five more days. One man can live ten. You forgive me, Captain, but... You killed Pearson, didn't you? In cold blood. Maybe I did. What of it? Are you going to court-martial me? Corey. Corey, you're demented. You're a madman. You already killed once. Don't make this any... Go. Oh. Oh. Corey, you... Murder. Sorry, Captain. Real sorry. But in a situation like this, there's no choice. No alternatives. It's not your fault. It just had to be. You can see that, can't you? What? Morning. That blasted sun already. Gotta get a move on. <sighs> Goodbye, Captain Donlan. Pearson. Now, what were you trying to say, Pearson? Lines in the sand. Something over the hill. Is that it? Well, I guess you got me thinking. I'll just have to... Check that one out one time. Uh. Uh. There. Now we'll see what you... What? What in the... Oh, my dear God. It's a highway. Pearson. Pearson. Now I know what you drew in the sand. It was a telephone pole. You were trying to draw telephone poles. And, and there's a sign. Reno, 97 miles. Captain Donlan, Pearson, all of them dead. Now I know what happened. I understand. We never left. That's why we went off the radar, why nobody tracked us. We never left the Earth at all. We just crashed back into it. Donlan, Pearson, I'm sorry. Oh, please, please forgive me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Practical joke perpetrated by Mother Nature and a combination of improbable events. Practical joke wearing the trappings of nightmare, of terror, of desperation. Small human drama played out in a desert less than a hundred miles from Reno, Nevada, USA. Continent of North America. The Earth. 
the solar system, the galaxy, and of course, the Twilight Zone. We'll be back to the Twilight Zone in a moment. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes